we're going right. to start it off tonight with Isaiah 9, 6, and I oh. think you'll know where I'm going with this. It says, a child is born to us, a son is given to us. The phrase, El Gibor, mighty God. Mighty God is very important because this phrase is used by Isaiah in Isaiah 10, 20, 21. Now, I know you guys know it, but for those who don't know, in the next chapter, Isaiah tells us that Yahweh, the Holy One of Israel, he is the mighty God, El Gibor. Very important. Because yep. according to Isaiah, there is no other God besides Yahweh, and no God shall be formed after him. Well, if there is no other God besides Yahweh, and no God shall be formed after him, and Yahweh is the mighty God, then for the child to be born, to be mighty God, he must be Yahweh. According to the scriptures, no one is ever positively called mighty God except Yahweh. Meaning, unless he can show that this child is an exception, the only one who can be rightly rightly called the mighty God is Yahweh. So, point being, you want to first establish the fact that the child is called mighty God, he must be Yahweh. Go to Isaiah 10, 20 to 21 to see it. So they can see Okay, in Isaiah 10, 20 to 21, if you want to read 20 to 21, you'll see who the mighty God is. It will come to pass in that day the remnant of Israel and those who have escaped from the house of Jacob will no more again lean on him who struck them, but shall lean on Yahweh, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. In verse 21, a remnant will return, even the remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God. So Yahweh, the only one of Israel, is the mighty God, right? Amen. And yet in chapter 9, the child born is the mighty God, right? Yep. So in Isaiah 9, 6 to 7, you see there the child born is who? The mighty God. But in the next chapter, the mighty God is Yahweh. So it's inev inevitable that the child born is Yahweh in the flesh. Can't get around it. So the whole point is you can't have two mighty gods. For Israelites, there's only one mighty God, and that's Yahweh. But the child born right. is the mighty God. So there you have a problem. And by the way, even the words, wonderful counselor, they're used of Yahweh elsewhere. They're used in Isaiah 25, 1 and 28, 29, the wonderful counselor. Those words are actually used of Yahweh in Isaiah 25, 1 and Isaiah 28, 29. Check it out. Ooh, let me look at that. Wow. Yeah. Yahweh, you are my God. I will exalt you. I praise your name for you. have done wonderful things. Wow. Things done long ago. And complete faithfulness and truth. Wonderful things. Wonderful. That ties in with the word wonderful, Pele, right? And then counsels, Yoetz. And Isaiah 28, 29. Watch what it says there. This also comes out from Yahweh Varmus, who's wonderful in counsel. There it is. Oh, wow. Man, I did. This is something I just now put together. Wow, great job. And excellent in wisdom. So the expressions, the characteristics, titles given to the child are applied to Yahweh elsewhere. Even with the word, when you say Abi Ad, the word Ad, is I use of uh, Yahweh in Isaiah 57, 15, where it says uh, he inhabits eternity. Ad, that's the word in Hebrew. For the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity. That's what the word is. Name oh, yeah. It's the word Ad. Abi Ad. Yeah. Not I mean, Ad. Ad, Ad yeah. His father. It's the word yeah. Ad. So who yes. inhabits eternity? Yahweh. And that's the word Ad. And the child is the father of Ad. He's the father of eternity. Right. Now you have a that's problem. That's right. Yeah, Ad there, yeah. yeah. You have a problem. Because if Yahweh inhabits eternity and the child is the father of eternity, he has to be Yahweh. Otherwise, someone other than Yahweh is a source of eternity. So what you're seeing is all the characteristics ascribed to the child are applied to Yahweh elsewhere. And is Yahweh called Ab, Father? Yeah. Isaiah 63, 16 and Isaiah 64, 8. So all the titles of the child are applied to Yahweh elsewhere. Isaiah 63, 16, it says, you are our father, Ab, right? You right. see, Abinu, the word is Ab. Abinu, Ab, meaning our Ab. You see it? Our father. Yeah. Ab, Inu, meaning Abinu, Abi. Ab, our father, Abi Nu, Ab, Abi. So you see, guys, all the characteristics of the child apply to Yahweh elsewhere. It is Yahweh who's wonderful in counsel. It is Yahweh who inhabits Ad. It is Yahweh who's our Ab, Abi, right? Father of us, Abi Nu, Abi, father of us. 
and it's in Isaiah 64. Eight. So there is no way that the child cannot be God in the fullest sense unless we have multiple gods, and that's not going to work. There's only one God, but obviously the child is not the father because the child is distinguished in that it says Yahweh of hosts will accomplish this. If you read Isaiah 9, 7, Yahweh hosts will accomplish all this for the house of David and that this child will be a Davidic king sitting on David's throne. So somehow he's distinguished from that Yahweh of hosts, but identical with him. That's why we're Trinitarians. Here's Judges 13, 18. Yes. And Pele, we have here, wonderful. Yes. So the angel connects so they, himself with that title. Yeah. So open up so we can see the context of that. Now, the context of Judges 13, if you guys ever want to read it, starts at 3 and goes at 24. It is the annunciation to Manoah and his wife that they're going to give birth to Samson. So then, just to give people a quick rundown, and Manoah's wife sees a man, and he tells her she's pregnant, and he gives her instructions on how to raise a child. He's a Nazarite. You know, no razor will touch his head, stays away from strong intoxicants. She senses something special about him, so she goes to Manoah and says, a man of God came to me who, who resembled the angel of God. And he told me I'm pregnant. So then Manoah prays and asks God to send that man. So he shows up. Now, they don't know it's the angel of God. They don't know it's the angel of God. So as the man of God is now talking to Manoah, he instructs him. So then we're going to pick it up for, in that context. Judges 13, read 17 to 18. Manoah said to Yahweh's angel, what is your name? that when your words happen, we may honor you. Yahweh's angel said to him, why do you ask me about my name? Since it is wonderful or incomprehensible, yeah, but- Click on the note, he'll tell you. Click on the note, he'll show you. Yeah. See, it says note. Wonderful, yeah. Okay, you catch it. Now, guys, you see the, the angel's response. Now, he doesn't know it's the angel. He says, why do you ask my name? Because it's wonderful. Now, let me explain to everyone what that means. The term wonderful means something that is beyond understanding, something that is mind-blowing, something that's perplexing. Now, understand the response. What he's saying is, why do you ask about my character? It's beyond comprehension. He's yeah. saying to him, basically, don't ask about my character. Now, you may wonder, well, what's the connection with name character? Well, if you do a search on how the Bible uses name, how the Bible uses name, the term name, Shem in Hebrew or Onoma in Greek, doesn't simply mean, hey, what's your name? Ah, oh, Tony. No, no. In the Bible, names are significant because names are descriptions of your character, your qualities, your being, and or your authority. And it's often prophetic of how you'll turn out. Fine. You'll read yeah. the Bible, you'll see this, right? So, oh, yeah, like sons of Belial is a good yeah, example. Belial. But it's just like when Esau came out. Why was he, he was called? red? He, yeah, he was and red. Jacob, because he grabbed from the heel. Yes, Yaakov. Or Ishak, Isaac means laughter. Or Moses, Moshe, because he was drawn out of the water. So you understand, in the Bible, name means more than simply, hey, Tony or Joey. No, name is referring to the characteristics, the nature and authority of a thing. So what basically he's saying is, why do you ask about my nature? It's beyond comprehension. No creature can say that, by the way. No creature can no. say, hey, why do you ask about my name, inquire about my nature? It's beyond comprehension. Only God can say this. But the man said it. This shows that this angel is not a mere creature because a creature cannot say, why do you ask my name, seeing it's beyond comprehension? That's what it means. It's wonderful. Don't bother, because the more you try to ponder about my name, my character, the more complex and confusing it will be. It's above your pay grade. You know, ironically, that's the same thing the man said to Jacob, who wrestled Jacob in Genesis 32. If you go there and you read Genesis 32, 24 to 30, but read from 26 to 28. And said, let me go, because the dawn has come. I won't let you go, Jacob replied, unless you bless me. Yep. And the man asked him, what's your name? Jacob, he responded. Your name won't be Jacob anymore, the man replied, but Israel, because you exerted yourself against both God and men 
and you've emerged victorious. Now Jacob asks his name in 29. Okay, now you ask my name. What is your name? Look what he says in 29. Please, Jacob inquired, tell me your name. But he asked, why are you asking about my name? And he blessed Jacob there. Oh, yeah. Wow, that's that's amazing. He says, why you ask my name? And what did the man say to Manoah? Why do you ask my name? Now, notice then that Jacob realizes this man is God, because what do he say in verse 30? Jacob would call that place Peniel because I saw God face to face, but my life was spared. Wow. Now you're going to see this is the same reaction Manoah gives, because I'm trying to tie it in with Manoah. Now go back to Judges 13. But you start at 17, so you can see it. Now watch how both these figures, because they're one and the same, respond the same way, and the reaction of the people who encounter them is the same. Because Jacob realized, hey, this was God, and I saw him face to face, right? Yep. But now read from 17 to 23. Manoah asked the angel of the Lord, what's your name? Because when that or when what you said happens, we'll glorify you. The angel of the Lord answered him, why are you asking this about my name? It's wonderful. So Manoah prepared a young goat and a grain offering and offered it on the boulder to the Lord, who kept on performing miracles while Manoah and his wife watched continually. When the bird offering was engulfed in flames that sprang up from the altar toward heaven, the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame that came from the altar. You understand the implication of that? He became part of the sacrifice. Yeah. A precursor to him offering himself on the cross for our sins, right? Yes. Wow. Because he jumped in the fire. He became part of the sacrifice. Wow. Do you guys see it? See yes, it. I do. Wow. <laughs> what did he ask him to offer again? He said, offer to God what? And what did Manoah offer? Sorry, I had to let the cat in. A uh, young goat and grain offering. Okay. And so when he offered it, he jumped in the fire, becoming part of the sacrifice. Because that's what he's going to do in the future. He will be the sacrifice for our sins. Because this is Jesus, obviously. But catch that. And so what blew them away is they thought he was just a man. No man jumps in a fire and disappears. So they realized this was no man, right? Right. But here's where you're going to see that Manoah knew this was the angel. Because in 21, now watch, they realize this was no ordinary man. So who do they realize it was in verse 21? The angel of the Lord did not appear again to Manoah or to his wife. And then Manoah knew confidently that the visitor had been the angel of the Lord. Now notice what it did not say. He knew confidently that the visitor was God, right? Right. So he knew it was the angel of the Lord, right? Yep. But now why does he say what he say in 22? Look what he says in 22. Then Manoah told his wife, we are going to die for sure because we've seen God. Okay, now I'm confused. It says he knew it was the angel of the Lord. So why did he say we've seen God when it says he knew this was the angel? They are one and the same. Because he knew this angel is God, not a mere creature. Because it's clear it says he knew this was the angel of the Lord. So then why did he say, hey, we've seen God? Because... They knew the angel is God, sent by God. He's not a creature. But they were under the suspicion to see God means to die, right? That's yeah. what they thought. But they're learning re repeatedly, no. God in his graciousness will allow you to see him without dying. That's why Jacob called the place Peniel. He goes, man, I saw God face to face yet my life was spared. See, because they thought if God appears, we're going to die. Right. Jacob said, wow, he appeared and he didn't kill me dead. And even now Manoah, wow, this was God appearing as a man. We're going to die. And the wife says, no, we're not. Because if he wanted to kill us, would he have accepted a sacrifice from us? So you see, number one, the angel says, why do you ask my name? Seeing it's wonderful. Pali in Hebrew. Secondly, notice that in 22, Manoah realized that this is the angel of God. And he says, we have seen God. So the angel is God appearing as a man, right? But in 21, it says, Manoah knew that it was an angel of the Lord. So he knows this is an angel, but he knows this angel is God, and he appears as a man, and the angel says, my name is wonderful, right? Right. Okay, but Isaiah 9 says, the child born, his name is wonderful, and he's the mighty God. Two connections with the angel of the Lord. So the two things about this angel, 
He says his name is wonderful and he is God appearing as a man. Now, Isaiah 9, 6, this is the connection. Here's a child who is born and his name is wonderful, like the angel. And he's the mighty God, just like the angel is God. This is the connection he's trying to make. That the angel is this child who is born to reign on David's throne. This is what he's trying to show everyone. So here's your proof. Jesus is the angel. Because this is a prophecy of Jesus being born as a male baby. But now I'm going to really blow your minds away. Because I'm going to show you the Jews got it too. The Jews understood. Oh, wow. Now watch here. The Jews understood that the child born here in Isaiah 9 was the angel of the Lord. Why? Because when the Jews translated Isaiah 9 into Greek, and here's what people don't understand about the Greek version of the Testament. When the Jews translated the Old Testament into Greek or Aramaic, they didn't always translate literally. They often would paraphrase to give you what they thought the meaning was. Now, when I show you the English translation of Isaiah 9, taken from the Greek, you're going to get blown away because according to the Greek, this is the angel who's being born. It says, the angel of great counsel. Now watch how they translate. Now, the Greek is to your right. So if you guys can read Greek, it's right there, but the English gives it to you. Isaiah 9, 6. What does it say? So let me yeah. put it they all added, together. They also added the English translation of the Hebrew, but it's okay, where it says, uh, wonderful counselor. That's why you see it has, uh, like, what is it called? Not brackets. They put it in between. What is that called? You see yeah. where it says, okay. That's telling you that this is not in the Greek. They're taking it from the Hebrew. But the Greek, it's for a child is born to us, son is given to us, whose government is upon his shoulder. His name is called the messenger of great counsel. But the word messenger is angelos, angel of great counsel. Here it is. Beautiful. The Jews, you, yeah. the Jews are telling you the child is the angel of the great counsel. The angel of the great counsel. The word messenger is the word angelos, where we get angel. It's there in the Greek. So they understood it that, and also that I think the New Testament writers, I can almost give evidence, and like the, uh, my my God, my Lord, that is that is, that is a Septuagint reading. So, yep. I mean, the New Testament writers knew about the Septuagint, so it's a valid oh, yeah, translation. Several examples where they're quoting the Greek version of the Old Testament, not the Hebrew. I can do that for you, but everyone understand this is a Jewish translation of the Old Testament, which the Christians adopted. They're telling you the child born is. The angel of great counsel. In fact, the Greek, I, because again, if you guys don't read Greek, you'll see to your right, it says to, what well, looks like a T-O, O-V-O-M-A. That's onoma, autu, megalis, boelis, angelos. And the name of him is great counsel angel. Angel of great counsel. There's a the word angelos. And if you guys can't read Greek, the word angelos You'll see it looks like an A Y Y E L O S. Can you highlight it? It's right there. Uh, here it is, right here. I'm going to highlight it. Right there. Okay. That's the word angelos. That's the word angel. That's the Greek word for angel. So the, it's literally the angel of great counsel. And you want to know where the Greek where, where great is? It's megalis. You see the word before, buelis? That's megalis. It means mega, megas, great. Right here. And Boelis means counsel. Great counselor, mighty God, beautiful. So the Jews told you the child is the angel of the great counsel. So Messiah is the angel of God, the messenger of God, the angel of Yahweh, the one who appeared as a man whom they knew was God and worshipped him as such. That's him. He's, he's the one who now becomes a child from the Virgin Mary by the Holy Spirit, Matthew 1, 18 to 20, Luke 1, 34, 35. 